thanks to the organizers for extending an invitation to come here. It's, of course, always a pleasure to interact with uh, in vitro, uh, but we also welcome any opportunity to learn how other users are using the software and how it can inspire us to use the software in a more efficient manner. Uh, when I came in this morning, someone told me that if a last-minute conflict would have arisen that would have prevented me from making it here, uh, Eli had prepared a dance routine to fill in the time. <laughs> so I, I'm highly tempted to end the talk here, but that wouldn't be fair for the folks on WebEx. So I'll, uh, all right, excellent. So I'll move along then. Uh, so I'll start my talk with a brief overview of the biomedical imaging group at Takeda. Then I'll jump into a detailed description of our PET-CT uh, study workflow. Uh, we have a lot of uh, more exotic applications, but what I'll be presenting today will be the standard uh, PET imaging workflow where we're extracting uh, or requiring static data and extracting semi-quantitative measures. I'll then give an example of how we use a script or more advanced application. I'll talk a little bit about the impact that VivoQuant and IPAX has had on our uh, PET-CT study workflow, and I'll end the talk with uh, some thoughts for the future. So the biomedical imaging group at Decatur Pharmaceutical consists of seven individuals. We have two PET imaging scientists, of which I am one. We have an MRI imaging scientist, one optical and CT imaging scientist with expertise in model development and animal procedures. We have two molecular biologists, and a software engineer, Oslem, who's here today. Uh, so we cover pretty much uh, the main skills that you need to either design studies or uh, carry them out. In terms of modalities, we have an Inviant PET-CT scanner, which, uh, on which we conduct most of our nuclear medicine studies. We have a MicroPET R4, should the Inviant break, or should there be an overflow from that machine. Uh, we also have a Xenogen for optical imaging experiments and a 7 Tesla MRI scanners. Now, I didn't list other modalities, but we also have uh, SPEC capabilities, Maestro capabilities. We have a cryomicrotome with a Typhoon imager, should we want to do autoradiography. And we also have both liquid scintillation and uh, gamma counting capabilities for when we conduct radio tracer uptake assays that complement uh, the work we do on these uh, imaging scanners. In terms of software, we, of course, use IPAX and VivoQuant. Uh, there's also other software that we use in the process of uh, conducting our studies, one of which is a tumor measurement system, which was an in-house built system that captures all non-imaging study-related information, in addition to tumor volume measurements throughout efficacy study, for example, uh, information about the compounds used, lot information, dosing route schedules, detailed protocols on how the study is conducted, and also uh, information related to samples that we may submit along with the study. Like I said, all the information within that system is non-imaging related. Uh, for MRI data processing, we also have an in-house uh, software that we sometimes use. And finally, we use MathLab, either as a standalone application or uh, taking inputs from some of these other software and reprocessing it in different ways. So the activities we do within our groups fall within one of the three following categories. We either enhance, we advance, or we translate. In terms of enhancing our own capabilities, we constantly try to develop or acquire new animal models, imaging probes, or imaging techniques, try to develop new assays to complement our imaging data, and of course, try to acquire new software and hardware. In terms of advancing early or late discovery projects, we try to use imaging in many different ways to answer some of the questions the team may have. And I listed examples here of some questions uh, teams often come up with. Uh, questions related to target expression, pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic uh, data. Um, in terms of efficacy, we also use imaging potentially to look at toxicology or use a variety of probes to study metabolism throughout the course of treatment. Uh, we also use in vivo uh, imaging as an in vivo biology tool to study mechanisms of action or resistance. And finally, uh, we can use imaging to look at tumor heterogeneity, either at baseline or how it evolves through the process of treatment. And then obviously, uh, one of the ultimate goals of our group is to translate some of the work we do preclinically into the clinic to help our clinical uh, trial efforts. And for that, we work with uh, development project teams 
to try and see how imaging could uh, help inform indications, uh, combination selections, how we can uh, inform decisions in terms of dosing routes or schedule, and also how we can work to qualify some translatable imaging biomarkers. Now, within all these three categories, we do a lot of work in-house, but we always collaborate with an academic institution or industry partners, such as in vitro. And in parallel, of course, to all of these activities we do, we process data. And we do a lot of processing. I thought that was a lot until I heard uh, Jacob describe the number of IOIs that you guys actually imported in your system. Uh, but I just pulled together the numbers uh, for the Envion and R4 in our labs. And I compiled the number of scans we did the past five years. This is a little bit older data, so that's why 2015 is a little bit behind. Um, and I also compiled the number of ROIs we drew, and I made the assumption that we spent about eight minutes drawing an ROI to try and understand how many days we spent scanning, assuming eight-hour days. Now, in reality, it takes us a little bit less time than eight minutes to draw an ROI, but if you account for the time it takes to transfer metadata, pre-process the data, generate reports, I made the assumption that it was around eight minutes. Point being that processing data takes us a lot of time. And we'd like to try and minimize that time wherever possible while maintaining the quality of the data that we uh, generate. And that's where in, in VivoQuant and IPACS come into play. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I will now uh, run you through our typical standard PET-CT study workflow, uh, which consists of approximately 10 steps, depending how you slice it. The first step, uh, which takes place even before we plan the study, is that we calibrate our scanner. We do two types of calibration, the first one being a co-registration. And for that, we take a short acquisition, PET-CT acquisition, of a cylinder that contains four radioactive point sources, load the reconstructed data in VivoQuant, co-register both images manually, and save this transformation as a default shift. And as a result, every time subsequently that we'll load a PET and CT data set into VivoQuant, it'll automatically be co-registered. The next calibration that we derive is a calibration factor to help us derive quantitative data. In other words, to convert raw counts per cc from the image into microcuries per cc. For this, uh, we do the standard procedure. So we inject a known amount of radioactivity in a conical tube that contains water. We acquire several scans over time as the radioisotope is decaying within the cylinder. Reconstruct the images, draw ROIs of consistent volume on all of these cylinders and plot the expected amount of radioactivity with the raw counts that are derived. And by doing a simple linear regression, we can extract the SUV calibration factor that we'll use later to convert our data to quantitative data. So as I mentioned, we don't do this for every study. We do this, for example, every time we have maintenance on the scanner or anytime something changes. And once it's done and saved, we don't worry about it anymore. The next step, preparing data backup and transfer folders, we do do before uh, each study. First thing we do is on our local server, we create a backup folder, folder X. Then on, we navigate through IPACS, and in the projects folder uh, in IPACS, we create two folders. We create folder Y that will contain the raw data and whose structure will mirror the structure of folder X on our local server. And we'll also create folder Y underscore P for pre-processed data. And that's where, like I said, the pre-processed data will end up, but also all the ROI data and any reports generated. Finally, we use IPACSync to create a job that runs in the background that will automatically transfer the data from folder X to folder Y on the IPAX as it is uh, transferred. We do specify that we only are interested at the moment on the IPAX of seeing the I, uh, PET and CT images along with the associated header files. But if we needed to uh, change that, we'd have the flexibility to also add list mode data, for example. Then we can finally go to uh, acquiring our data. So to maximize throughput, we've printed a uh, bed using a 3D printer. And that bed contains four uh, ports for delivering anesthesia during scan. And so typically for our study, we'll acquire four mice uh, per scan. Each time we acquire a scan, we record for each mouse on an Excel spreadsheet the following information. So we capture the dose in the syringe, the residual, injection time, scan time, animal weight, tumor width, and tumor length. And moving forward, I'll refer to these as metadata for each mouse. 
At the end of the day, when all the data is acquired, we manually copy the data from the acquisition uh, machine to the backup folder, folder X on our server. And as I said, IPAC Sync will be running in the background to make sure that uh, the data structure is mirrored into folder Y on IPAX. Once we're done with the study, we can then pre-process our data. <coughs> and that's especially uh, applicable and relevant for when we scan four mice at a time, which is most of the time these days. Uh, for that, uh, we've worked with uh, Bill and TJ to create a hotel pre-processing script. And all we have to do is to open the script in Notepad++ and edit the location of folder X, the location of, uh, sorry, the location of folder Y on the IPAX, folder Y underscore P in the IPAX, and typically we ensure that the voxel size is approximately 0.4 millimeter um, Q, uh, on each side. There are some other parameters that we can modify, but these are the standard ones uh, that will change. And once we run the script from VivoQuant, what it'll do is it'll segment each mouse, co-register them, crop the images and generate four individual files into the underscore P folder on IPAX that we can then go in and manipulate. Before we start drawing ROI, we need to enter the metadata. And as I said, that metadata is captured as we're acquiring data in an Excel spreadsheet separately. Um, that's the mouse metadata. So we'll export a spreadsheet from IPAX on the <coughs> underscore P folder, the tumor analysis spreadsheet copy that data into that spreadsheet and re-import and it will automatically assign uh, each metadata point with the appropriate image. At the study level, there's two uh, data points that we tend to enter. First one is the SUV cal that I mentioned at the beginning that will allow us to get that quantitative uh, information. And the second one, we do modify the gamma correction to allow us to visualize uh, the images a little bit clearer at the data selection and uh, compilation step for visual QC. Then we can go in and start drawing ROIs. So for that, we load uh, PET-CT images one by one into VivoQuant. We adjust the intensity of both uh, image sets to levels that are consistent throughout the study, but also uh, make it easy for us to visualize what we're interested in drawing. For most of our study, we work with xenograph models that are on the flank of the animal, so they're easy, easily visual, visualizable, uh, as shown here. And so for drawing uh, tumor ROIs, we like to manually draw them on coronal cross-section using the spline tool. What we'll do is we'll draw an outline of the tumor on a particular slice, then move three or four slices further and draw another one of these ROIs, depending on the complexity of the geometry of the tumor, and until we've covered most of the tumor as illustrated here. Then use the interpolate ROI which is a function we absolutely love because it saves us some time in drawing regions on each of these slices. And in some rare cases where we have some regions of the RIs that are protruding outside or in, uh, we use subsequent eroding and dilating function to smooth things out. Once we're satisfied with the appearance of the ROI, we save it to IPAX, and we can then move on to uh, the next animal. Once we've drawn all the ROIs within our study, we can then compile the data and start the plotting job. So for that, a lot of you are familiar with that uh, particular workflow, but we use the processing tool in IPAX. We select the tumor PET and nuclear medicine analysis, select all the images that we're interested in processing, and then launch the job and monitor its process through the job queue. Once the job is completed and we see that fantastic green light, we can then uh, select our data. Now, the select data step uh, is, a le well, is because this particular workflow uh, can be used for automatic segmentation of the tumor. However, when you uh, provide IPAX with some manually drawn ROI, it will skip the segmentation and automatically give you the ROI you drew. So what you see in that page is essentially what's shown here. You see the raw image and you see uh, the image with your ROI overlay. And so that's a good step for us to do visual QC because one, we can make sure that there is indeed only one ROI and that that ROI uh, is over the region that we're trying to uh, capture and quantify. Once we've gone through all of the images, everything is good, we can finalize the report and start plotting. And so step eight is to generate the report and for that we have several different options available to us. Uh, one of these options is to capture the um, uh, 
study report that's automatically generated by IPAC. It's a PDF file that contains uh, images of each individual animal on each day that the mouse was imaged, along with some uh, quantitative data at the bottom. We can also capture uh, the aggregate plots that are generated as part of the plotting job. That's a large PDF file that contains graph of data sliced many different ways, depending how you want to uh, look at it. And we also have the option to save uh, the plotmaster.csv file, which is a simple Excel, spread file, like Excel spreadsheet file that contains a, uh, the ROI volume associated with each animal, the injected dose, and also the mean and max value of the tumor, the body, and the cylinder. If the user is interested in generating custom graph, he can start with this Excel spreadsheet to make his, own, his or her own graphs. Uh, next up for us is when we interact with teams and we want to communicate the data, we like to generate a study summary that's easy to uh, uh, convey the information that we're interested in conveying, that the data is conveying. Uh, so for that, it's a PowerPoint file where we put some background, some experimental design consideration, insert some graphs, and some example or all of the images that were generated as part of this study. And this is a step for which we, uh, with the help, again, of Bill and TJ, created two different VQ scripts to give us some flexibility in terms of what format we could save these images. And again, it's very similar to what I presented above. We specify a local folder where we'd like to save that data. And by tweaking a few parameters, we can either save the images as a PET CT MIP movie, a static PET CT MIP, PET or CT alone MIP. Uh, we can create coronal cross sections, transverse cross sections, or sagittal cross sections that each go through the center of the uh, tumor with or without a tumor ROI outline. And we can even segment out tumors and generate a uh, rotating movie of the MIPS for display purposes. Finally, we include some conclusion. And as I said, we can then use this document to present to the project team uh, the key results from the experiments. Uh, last step but not least, we have to record this data into our notebook. And for that, we use an electronic notebook at Takeda. And this is where we capture basically everything that we've generated through the study. So protocols, uh, raw spreadsheet acquisition, any scans or manual notes that were taken during the study, graphs that relate to uh, tumor growth, um, and any form of data that you're interested in capturing go into the ELN. So this is our basic uh, workflow. Now, as I illustrate here, uh, with three rotating MIPS of tumors that were injected with either FDG, FLT, or FMISO, you can appreciate that the uptake in these tumors is not homogeneous. It's highly a heterogeneous. And there's uh, some potential information in capturing this spatial heterogeneity. And so for that, our software engineer has programmed algorithms that can automatically extract a whole series of metrics that relate to uh, tumor heterogeneity features. However, that particular uh, algorithm takes as an input not only the raw, pixel, uh, raw voxel intensity, but also the voxel location. And so for that, we had to generate a VQ script that can provide the uh, MATLAB algorithm that input. And so we wrote a script that is very similar to the script that extracts a rotating MIP of the isolated tumor, except that instead of saving uh, the data as a GIF file, it saves it as a raw data locally. And that can be used for downstream analysis. Um, I wanted to provide some thought of what I thought the impact of VivoQuant and IPAX has had on our PET CT study workflow. And I guess what I'm listening here reflects what others have experienced uh, and communicated earlier. We've seen dramatic increase in data organization. Uh, we, have, we now have a web-based database that is centralized, it is searchable, and it is trackable for audit purposes. So that's a definite plus over what we were doing traditionally, which was working off a main server. Um, it's increased our flexibility for data viewing, ROI drawing, and data reporting. And that's very important because sometimes providing with a rotating movie of the mouse with an easy to localize tumor has some value for people that are not uh, familiar with imaging. It's allowed us to uh, automate certain steps of the processing workflow. 
talked about how we've automated image generation, how we've automated uh, generation of reports like the aggregate plots, the plot master, and the study reports. And we've used scripts for automating uh, other steps. I think we still have some uh, room for further improvement, but based on what I've heard uh, today and what Eli just presented, it seems like there's definitely opportunity for uh, making further improvement. And last but not least, uh, technical support from Eden Vicro is always there, and it's been great to have uh, your guys' help for not only creating scripts, but trying to think on how we can improve our own workflow. And then uh, with your guys' own ex expertise and getting feedback from other customers to seeing how you're moving the software further and making it more useful and even more flexible. Uh, just in terms of future outlook, as I said, I think there's some potential room for improvement in terms of how we do things. And it seems, like I said, the, the software team is thinking along those directions. So some of the questions we were having was whether or not we could capture the imaging metadata automatically into IPAX directly, rather than having to copy-paste from an Excel spreadsheet into IPAX. Um, is there a way to fully automate our pre-processing script so that we wouldn't need to visually QC the proper segmentation of each mouse but making the script robust enough so that we can just launch it, walk away, and then come back and have all the images uh, segmented out? Is there a way to automatically generate the metadata? And can that be transferred automatically? If it's captured automatically for a four-mile scan, can it automatically be transferred into the individual mouse files and the pre-processed folders? Uh, we haven't started doing this, but I know the opportunity is there to incorporate other data uh, that we capture with our uh, imaging studies, such as pathology images, genetic data, PD, et cetera. Um, so we're going to start thinking in that direction. Um, it seems like the report generation is going to get even more flexible, and that's something we're interested in. Can we automatically generate graphs uh, after drawing the ROI data without having to go through the processing uh, tool in IPAX. Um, finally, is there a way to automatically generate a customized uh, study report rather than us having to copy paste into a PowerPoint file or in an Excel uh, spreadsheet like Sarah said? That seems like an interesting solution. And finally, is there ways to have ELN interact with IPAX such that users in the future who are interested in looking back into older experiments can uh, access by a few clicks the original data uh, safely in IPAX. And we hope by continuing to make headways uh, on these different aspects, we'll be able to keep enhancing, advancing, and translating while minimizing the time we spend on processing. And as I said, maintaining the same level of quality in the data we generate. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the imaging group at Takeda, who I'm representing today and the whole in vitro team, uh, like I said, for sending the invitation and for their continuous support in uh, our studies. So I'll end here, and I'll take any questions you guys may have.